Gordon. There's a guy called Lee Gordon's asked to access the meeting. Can I send him on to you, Amy? No, he's actually, yeah, he's just, he's he's just here now. <laughs> well, yeah, well, Raymond Gormley, Consumer Council, that's, that's, two, that's, that's, that's two newbies there today. I thought you'd be looking to get part of, 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 of the new back of the new backroom team up on Ergo Kieran. No. <laughs> no chance. Hi, Raymond. <laughs> Hello. It's Nicola. <laughs> I can't. Uh, can't Can you see not see me? Hold on. That's because there's loads of us. Sounds like a therapy session for energy efficiency people. <laughs> Give it an hour a minute, so we'll, um, and then I'll kick off. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, people will join later then, are you, Robert? So, um... <laughs> Who's coming from Fermanagh? We don't actually count that as late if they're here before half ten. That's <laughs> that's reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Hey, may I just send that to you there? The response. So. Brilliant. Thank you, Robert. Morning, folks. Morning. Morning, Morning Bruno. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Just <clears throat> didn't chat. Didn't realise the time. <laughs> Are you working now, Bruno? I'm in energy, Robert. I'm back in energy. All right. Hey. Sitting <laughs> behind me here, Robert. Just yes. Okay. All right. Right. Yeah. Hi, Nicola. Hi. Hello, Nicola. How are you? That's a good Hi. energy team. Does that mean I know most yeah. of us now? <laughs> I know, I was going to say. And Lucy, well, Lucy actually was in yesterday, but I think she's at home today. Yeah. She's there. <laughs> yeah, the Wi Fi is fixed. Oh, there you are. Oh, I didn't realize. Hey, we're all here. This is great. What's your number like, what's your numbers like now, Amy? Whether should we go for it or not? We're 40 now, Robert. Yeah, uh, well, I would start, surely, yeah. Okay, listen, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Can, can that all come through, you know? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, you're very welcome to the energy options for uh, rural dwellers. It's the second seminar in a series run by the Hand Heat team, um, which includes ourselves, the Houses Edith, and, and our partners. Um, I'll just quickly go through. <coughs> yeah. So my name is Robert Clements, I'm the project lead for the Hand Heat project. Um, Hand Heat is a two million pound EU uh, interreg project. It's got seven partners across Europe, and this webinar is in a series where we're trying to raise awareness of renewable technologies across rural areas. So the agenda for today is we've got myself <coughs> just opening it, Barry McCarran from Southwest College. Stephen Farrell from Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, myself and Patrick Keaty from Ulster University, and then a quick question and answer session. The format really today is going to be, uh, if you can, can you mute all your things uh, <coughs> stop any background tittle tattle and interference. If you're worried about bandwidth or internet, turn your pictures off, but if not, uh, I'm easy up to yourselves. If you have any sort of questions... I so turn that off there, guys, that's going to have me rattling about. Um, if you've any questions 
during the presentations, please use the chat box and we'll get them answered as, as quick as we can. Uh, we will have a decent question and answer session at the very end, so that's probably the time to really ask any deep, deep, uh, really deep questions. Um, and really, apart from that, there, that really is the first um, part of it over. I just want to make you aware we have Fuel Poverty Awareness Day, and this Friday, it's actually run by the National Energy Agency, or, or National <laughs> Energy Action. Um, they're a UK fuel poverty charity. We've got a, an NI hub that's run by director Pat Austin. And if you uh, look up NEA's, NI's Twitter account, uh, you'll see if you look on the hashtag Fuel Poverty Awareness Day, uh, because of the road here on their site, winter is a difficult time. It's the most worse in living memory, lockdown, people and still in unemployment, uh, trying to look, <coughs> pay for eating or pay for heating. Uh, there's health conditions which come from it as well, from uh, poor, uh, poor indoor temperatures, and there's also a risk of more risk of COVID. <coughs> so to try and raise awareness of fuel poverty, uh, which we're still selling at 22% in Northern Ireland, which means one in five people are fuel poor and spend more than 10% of their net income on their energy and their heating bills, which is, to be really honest, unacceptable. So to raise awareness for this here, please link into NEA's Twitter account and the hashtag Fuel Poverty Awareness on Friday. So that's a, an unshamed plug for a, a very worthy uh, point. Now I just want to talk a wee bit about Hand Heat before we uh, get moving today. Hand Heat, as I said, it's a £2 million project. This was the time whenever we had the initial uh, contract initiation meeting, gosh, nearly two years ago. Um, the project has got five partners, or sorry, seven partners across five countries, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, the Republic of Ireland, uh, Scotland, Finland, Iceland, and yeah, that's it. So there's, there's the five countries and the uh, seven partners are the, our sales, the house Zellers lead partner, our Healthy Living Centre in Irwinstown, uh, Clara ICH uh, from Mayo, Pure Energy from uh, Shetland, Karelia University from Finland, Lucky Energy Agency from Finland, and Austrobrew, which is an energy agency from Iceland. And we're all working together, and that's really the whole team there. Um, the main deliverables are four main parts. Um, so the first thing is to look at policy review, fuel poverty and health and housing, and Una from Arc Healthy Living is leading in that there. We're looking at best practice, across all the different partner countries and seeing what's good and what's bad and, and what works and what doesn't work. We've got demonstration pilots, which basically means we're putting kit energy efficiency and low carbon heating into houses in Finland and, and into uh, Fermanagh here. And then after all that, we want to provide a toolkit to give people what is good for them in their uh, local areas. And this toolkit is for local communities, for yourself to see what works and what doesn't work. So effectively, it's about protecting rural communities. There's price, fluct price fluctuations with regard to oil, et cetera, social well-being and quality of living in the different regions. That's many of the four main outputs of the project as a whole with a full-time team of Catherine Savage as a project manager, uh, her assistant, uh, Amy Lewis, and Stephen Hill as our management accountant. And they're all working on this project. I only work part-time on it. But today we're essentially talking about the pilot part of it. We're talking about the kit that we're putting into people's houses and what we think is good and what we think is, is maybe not so good. And to get some expert opinion uh, from, from the various people across Romana and, and down south. Um, so that's hand heat. That's our housekeeping, a wee bit about fuel poverty awareness. And I'm now going to hand you back now over to Barry McCarran. Barry McCarran. Barry is, I'm just going to get his profile here. He's the head of business development at Southwest College. He's a senior lecturer at Southwest College. Um, he was heavily involved in, in the passive, first passive uh, education house, which is Crest and Fermanagh, and also involved in, in the Erin campus, uh, which has presently been uh, built at the moment. And I'm sure Barry will talk about that. He's also the chairman of the Passive uh, House Association of Ireland. And he recently completed his PhD at Queen's University. So it's now Dr. McCann. Well done, Barry. And he also lectured me in the certification passive course, which means if he can teach me, he can teach anybody. So Barry, uh, I will stop sharing and hand over to you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. 
I'm delighted to be here and present. I'm just waiting to see if I can share my screen. It says at the moment here, sorry, folks, um, host disabled participant screen sharing. So I think you just need to change that, Robert. Uh, is that me? Uh, or whoever, somebody. Hey, mate, help. <laughs> it's okay. I've seen it before. Yeah, sorry, I thought I had already done that, Barry. Um, give me a second. No. Just talk among yourselves, guys. No problem, just a second. Cool. Sorry, Barry. Is that you now? I yeah. need your co-host, but should I make him a co No, no, that, oh, that should be that. Perfect, sorry about that. No problem. Can you see my screen now, okay? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Okay, right. Well, th uh, delighted, as I said, to speak and have the opportunity to, to talk a little bit um, about passive housing. Um, I suppose Robert has set the scene there very well, um, and he has mentioned, of course, best practice. So really this is where the college has got involved in the whole area of passive house because we were we were looking forward over the next 10, 15, 20 years in the college, um, this is a number of years back, and we were forecasting what things are going to look like into the future. So this was why we, we, we sort of hitched our trailer to the passive house standard. And of course, it's not all about passive house either. The, the, the key message is energy efficiency. So that's really um, what, what I'm here to talk about uh, and, and to introduce you to some of the principles of Passive House, which can be taken and applied to any building or any home as well. So, um, of course, we all know about the climate change imperative at the moment. Uh, I've just included some pictures there in the presentation, which were from California earlier on this year, um, in which the, the, the sky um, then photographs were taken at 12 o'clock in the day. Um, so the, the sky has turned orange there with the amount of forest fires that were happening in November. Um, so, I mean, it's it's something that's clear and obvious um, in terms of the climate change imperative. So we're looking forward to the solutions and seeing what we can bring to the table. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, again, just take you through some of the, the things that are relevant um, that we can adapt for our own homes under, under the Passive House banner and, and what the learnings are from that. Um, the key thing is to have a, to facilitate any renewable energies is to really have an energy efficient house, and and that sounds so obvious and everyone has heard it over and over again, um, but it really is the pertinent point and it really needs to be executed on site to a level where you can get the heating demand down to such a level that then when you introduce the renewable energy technologies that they will work effectively, and um, so that so that's really. What the passive house standards about and, and we have five principles here that i'm going to talk through which will bring down your heat and demand to that level so of course this is best practice um but these five principles you can take and put them into into any retrofit project you're doing or into any new build project you're doing and and it doesn't have to be that you're you're getting the passive house certification under that so i'll just take you through them very briefly um, the first principle is is superior levels of insulation um, and, and what we're aiming for there is a U value of 0.15 or better. Okay, so the way the building regulations are moving in the south of Ireland now, we're at passive house levels of, of U value. Um, in Northern Ireland, unfortunately, the U value or the building regulations are, are, are imminently going to improve, I, I hear as well. So it will not be long to, to where at um, passive house levels. Of, of U values in Northern Ireland as well and elsewhere. Um, the second principle of all of this is really when, when you're adding that, when you get to that level of insulation and you're using that level of insulation, you really need to um, address the whole area of thermal bridging or, you, you know, in, in a sense, you could be really dealing with condensation and mould problems. Now, s some might think that that's not that important, but, but what actually happens is the more insulation you add, the more, the more important the thermal bridging becomes. So as, as we move towards low carbon housing, energy efficient, efficient housing, really, really truly energy efficient housing, thermal bridging is a key, key aspect of all of this. Uh, the third principle here is, um, of course, the windows. 
Um, so triple glazed windows, um, I, I proposed that anybody building a, a new building would be um, looking to put in triple glazed windows anyway. Um, and when it comes to a retrofit situation, you, you probably most likely be putting them in anyway. The cost uplift is no longer really, really significant now at the moment from where it was a few years ago. And then the last two principles um, are you're making the airtight, the building airtight in order to facilitate mechanical ventilation. And that point again is very important. Uh, and I'll just labor it for a wee moment. Uh, and that is you're making it airtight to facilitate mechanical ventilation. It's much like your car, in fact. Um, we, we, if you're driving along in your car on a wet day, water can't get into the car um, from the rain outside. So your car is relatively airtight. Um, and then in addition to that, when you're heating your car, it's, it's recovering heat from the engine and supplying it to you in the cockpit. That analogy is very, very similar to how the, these types of houses work. So four and five, go together really well. And of course, with the fifth one, it's become even more important now uh, in light of COVID-19 and the post-COVID world, um, you're, you're taking in 24 seven fresh air and exhausting steel air. And, and in that context, particularly in commercial buildings, Passive House is really becoming a solution for the post-COVID world as well. So that's very interesting as we go forward. So the standard itself, I, I, I've, talked, I've talked you through the five principles. Them, them same five principles um, are relevant to other standards under the banner of Passive House. So they have a, a retrofit standard for anybody who wants to retrofit their house to a Passive House standard. It's called Enerfit. And then they also have one which isn't heralded too much, um, and it's called the Passive House Institute Low Energy Standard. And, and I actually think that's where the building regulations will eventually end up at that low energy standard. I don't think Passive House will be the, the main standard. So that, that that's a relaxation of, of the Passive House numbers and it brings you back to um, to, to a slightly lower level at 25 kilowatt hours. Um, and there's the definition, a rigorous voluntary building standard, energy efficiency standard, focusing on the highest energy efficiency and quality at a low operating cost. So that's it. The other two standards that are fresh and new, new um, are um, Passive House Plus and Passive House Premium. And that's where they facilitate renewable energy, in particular, um, electricity generation, electricity storage, and the redirection of, of renewable energy, maybe onto the grid or into an electric car as well. So the, the standard is built and is predicated on what's coming next, which is the renewable en energy introductions. So. That's that slide. Um, so in order to sort of illustrate where I'm going with all of this, I have took an example which is very relevant in terms of the rural context. Now, I am aware it's a commercial building. So it's Southwest College's own building in, in, in the west of Northern Ireland in Inniskillen. So it's, it's, an, it's a campus building that was, that was built back in 1978. It's, it's 48 years old. Um, the, the heating demand of it at the moment is, is 152 kilowatt hours. Um, but I don't propose everybody knows, you know, the ins and outs of kilowatt hours. So, so really to make it understandable, it uses 100,000 litres of home heating oil a year to heat that building. That's the really important thing. And that costs £51,000 to the Northern Ireland taxpayer year on year. And of course, that goes up if oil prices go up and it goes down if they go down. They're quite low at the moment, but still we're, we're vulnerable to that. And, and it's a huge amount of cost and a huge amount of heating. So our new Earn Campus building, which is almost finished now, it's being built to the Passive House Premium Standards. That's the highest Passive House standard we can go to. And um, it's on the site of the old hospital in Inniskillen um, and, and work started in, on the design in 2016. So it's approximately the same size as the building I just showed you. Um, but what's very interesting about it is the bottom line here, and, and that is the bottom line. So the total heat cost for the Earn Campus when it's finished for the whole entire year would be just shy of £5,000. So that's a drop of, of almost £44,000, £45,000 difference between the new and the old. So to me, that's quite stark. It represents about a 90% a drop in, in savings. And, you know, building buildings to this standard it's quite obvious what it's going to do going forward. 
um, if you were to take the lifespan of the new Erin campus going forward at, at £45,000 a year. And of course, if you're then to, to take into account the rising cost of energy, um, that, that, that's, that's a good investment overall. So really um, where I'd be going with these five principles, if somebody really asked me and pushed me, you know, to explain it in a nutshell in two sentences, um, what would I say? Um, and I would call things like this where you have them five principles inherently and, and, and that you lift the bar on all five principles. You don't leave one out. I think that's the secret sauce in it all. Um, so I would call it a quality standard. I wouldn't even call it an energy efficiency standard in a way. I'd call it a quality standard for your home. Um, and what I have on the screen here is the different parts within the standard for training, for, for taking components for the building and independently testing them to see are they good or are they bad, not to take a, a commercial brochure from somebody who's selling the product. It's, it's an independent sort of thing. And then a third party oversees the certification of the building. So that's how there's very little performance gap with the passive house standard as well. Um, moving on, I've alluded to this, which is really, you have mechanical ventilation, so that allows you then to filter the air coming in and filter the air going out, um, and it allows you to quantify how much air is coming in and how much air is coming out. So um, the Pacify standard is built on a, a, an EN standard, 13779, so it's not the Pacify standard making this up or, or the people who've come up with it, It's uh, and you're aiming for this indoor air category or classification three of, of good quality indoor air. And that, that's the third one down there on, on just above the World Health Organization logo. And then looking at this graph, just very, very briefly, I don't want to drag it out, is um, if, you're, if you go from 18 degrees here to 26 on the bottom of the chart, that, that is right in the comfortable range. And then on the side, if you go to relative humidity from 30 to 70, again, that's in the comfort range. And you'll see that I have the COVID logo there. Um, if you're in this comfort range and you're getting this amount of air, it's already been said in the, in the research that's coming out around COVID from the World Health Organization and others, that this is safe for COVID as well. So the Passive House Institute comes with that additional bonus now. So again, I just wanted to finish off and close off by just you know sharing with you some developments which you might see in recent times. Um, down in Dublin, this is a new uh, social housing uh, development of 600 units, uh, apartments, and 550 of those 600 are being built to the Passive House standard. And, and that, that project's been run by the Land Development Agency in the south of Ireland. And that's their first big project into this space. Um, <clears throat> closer to home in Northern Ireland, right in the middle, we have the Crest Centre, uh, which is also in South West College's estate portfolio. The Erin campus, which I've mentioned up here at the very top, this white building, that is the, a retrofit of a school in, in Maharavili in, in, in Fermanagh as well, a, a really rural um, location. Up here, we have a, a home called Knock by Barn. It's a, being built to the Passive Standard on the northwest coast. And this is um, it, it, the guy who's building it's doing a blog at the moment. It's very popular, getting a lot of traction. Um, other things to point out is Goldsmith Street down here in the corner, this, this uh, grey brick, brick building. It won the RIBA Sterling Prize, was featured in Grand Designs, and it's a, it's a scheme in Norwich um, of social housing. Um, I think there's about 60 houses in it, and it's all built to the Passive House standard as well. Uh, over here, um, some might know this, uh, and it is where you're thinking, it's Galgorum Hotel in Northern Ireland, and the salt dome that's there as part of the spa, that is a certified passive house building as well. It's sort of like the hidden building in Northern Ireland that no one knows about, but it was bought off the shelf from China and it has that. Other things to just show you again, re more regional examples. Um, there's a Tesco down south in Clonmel. Uh, it's built to the passive house standard. We've got uh, private developers now moving into this space in the, in the next two slides here, if you can see my mouse. Um, Durkin Developments and uh, Michael Bennett Construction, um, both at Enniscorty and City West in Dublin. They're, this scheme is 57 houses, and the other one up here is 24. And then there's retrofits there as well uh, of, of semi Ds. So you can see one to the left and one to the right, which has been a before and after. 
Um, there's oh, yeah, and I mentioned these three schemes as well. So Durkin, Cosgrove, and Bennett. So these are all private developers who are starting to now really look at this because they know in their cycle for planning for the next five years that in five years' time, their their housing that they're building needs to be fit for purpose and relevant. Um, other things in, in GB to point out that are very relevant here. Down in the bottom corner, this is the tenement buildings in Glasgow. Uh, Glasgow's famous for, for some of those, but these are now, um, this particular scheme has been retrofitted all to the passive house standard with micro generation on the roof. Beside it here is a, a project called Anger Grove in Camden in London. Um, there's over a thousand units in that. Um, and then just here uh, on over in the other corner is a scheme in Manchester as well, where there was retrofit of council buildings to the passive house standard as well. And we've a lot of activity in Yorkshire, in Exeter down south, and uh, uh, the Norwich scheme there as well. I'd mentioned already. So uh, I'm almost finished. I just uh, there's an international flavour just to round out, which is um, just up in the top corner here is the new hospital in Frankfurt, the new hospital for the city of Frankfurt. Um, needless to say, I just sound like a broken record. I guess built to the Passive House standard as well. Um, we have the down here at the bottom. It's called St Sidwell's Point. That is in Exeter, and that's the new swimming pool and leisure centre there. Um, and then this iconic photograph at the bottom with the Washington Bridge, that of course is in um, New York City, and that's Cornell Tech University's uh, 30, 40 storey passive house building there as well. And um, this one here in the middle with the black facade is in Bilbao, and it's, it's a 28 storey passive house building as well. So um, again, there's a commercial feel to it. So just to finish off, us in the college, we provide training in all of this area for tradespersons for people who are from the industry and also people who are newbies and want to learn about the standard. We can take anybody, even if you don't have construction experience. And it's free. The, the Department of the Economy uh, are funding it. So you've, you've got it for free at the moment as well. So that's me for now. Um, I think it's question and answers later. So I'll, I'll just be quiet and let the next person talk perhaps. Okay, but Barry, thank you very much, and, and just and just sort of to, to round up, Barry. Barry basically showed that energy efficiency is the first principle we have to do before we put in any sort of renewables. He talked about the, the one of the most best known vehicles, that which is the passive house standard, and how passive house can basically close the, the uh, performance gap. And really, what that means for householders, if we build it better at the start, if we retrofit it better at the start, we cut down the uh, consumer's household bills, and as Barry alluded to as well, the building regulations now in Ireland is well behind that of England and Wales and the Republic of Ireland with regard to the performance standards, but hopefully next year they will be moving forward because that'll be a real key driver. There is a couple of questions there, Barry, from Lucy and from uh, Jerry from Spire 2. Maybe we'll leave them to the question and answer session because we, we, we can always bank them just in case we don't get any more. Um, and apart from that, I'm just now going to hand over to Stephen Farrell. Stephen Farrell is from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Stephen's background is civil engineering. He came into sustainable energy 10 years ago. Uh, he's worked around the energy development programs, such as Better Energy Warm Home Scheme, the Community Energy Grants, something we don't have in Northern Ireland, and I wish we did have. Uh, Stephen has led the delivery of the recently National Home Retrofit Program. So he's doing everything down south that I'd love to see happening up here in the north. Um, Stephen, you're very welcome. Um, yeah, you've got Trailblazer down south. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. No, uh, guys, thanks for uh, the invite. Um, very, uh, it was a great presentation there. I like to see that the principles you are applying is very much the same down here. Um, such as a fabric first approach, independent certification and so on. But I suppose just on myself, um, I'm project managing the National Home Retrofit Scheme. And we launched there in September, at the end of September. And I suppose our aim is to do um, 1,500 homes um, to a B2 by the end of the year, by the end of 2021. And the majority of it being via a fabric first approach uh, for the points that, that Barry discussed as well. And then kind of supplementing that with the uh, heat pump uh, technology. Uh, this topic is key, as everyone is aware of the, the challenges we face in transitioning away from fossil fuels, 
it's an imperative for homeowners, be it kind of in an urban setting or rural setting, build, build, building owners countrywide, in general, to become more familiar with and embrace renewable technologies all the way from heat pumps, PV and biomass. But it has to be kind of informed decisions and so on and, and to suit their building usage. Um, and as we, we're all aware, there's too much of our electricity and energy being generated from fossil fuels. So it just underlines the challenges we, we face. But okay, just moving on, in terms of the, the big picture stuff, uh, I'll, I'll touch this slightly, I won't, I won't labor on it. Uh, we all know the more uh, we utilize renewable technologies like heat pumps, solar PV, changing to EVs over um, diesel cars and harness the wind, the more we can move away from fossil fuel dependence reduce our CO2 emissions and increase our energy security. It's where, where we need to be. Um, so this applies to everything, everyone from the rural homeowner, say in Galway, to the multinational plant in, in Dublin. So ultimately our long-term goal um, that we have written in is decarbonize our energy supply um, by 80 to 90% by 2050. And then the short term is to hit our renewable targets agreed by the EU of 16% renewables by the end of 2020, which is, is looking unlikely now. And I suppose that there's forged a way for ambitious climate action plan targets between now and 2030. Um, so that's just a bit of a high level and where we're at in terms of our, uh, in terms of renewable energy targets. Um, and this is taken from our published Renew Renewable Energy in Ireland uh, document looking at 2018 data. And um, we're a fair bit away, like as you can see, our overall, we're 5% off the 16% the target. Um, a big laggard is the heat, the heat side of things. Um, and to try and support that, and you might be aware we have our uh, support scheme for renewable energies, which support non-domestic heat pump installations and biomass installations. Plus also we have our domestic heat pump grants and so on. So we're we're trying to make inroads in that 6.5%, but more and more work needs to be done. Um, just focusing in then, narrowing it into kind of two snippets from our climate action plan. And the big one there is, is on the building side, we're on the first step towards um, our ambitious target of 500,000 B2s in uh, making existing homes to B2 or equivalent by, by 2030. Um, B2 is defined as a cost, cost optimal solution by um, the building regulations part L um, and it's, it's kind of an acceptable level of energy efficiency of the money spent upgrading like ultimately we'd all love to upgrade to an A rate at home but it's not financially feasible and given the time we have to do all this in so SEAI's ask this year is to upgrade 8,000 homes to a B2 um, we need to get the 13,000 in total countrywide, so that'll be supplemented by 5,000 local authority homes being upgraded to a B2. Um, and this needs to be done. It's easy to go out there and, and cherry pick homes, but it needs to be done with the right informed approach, such as fabric first, ensuring there's a satisfactory HLI um, to accommodate heat pumps and so on. And also we need, we're looking at how our retrofit is being delivered in terms of removing barriers from homeowners. Um, a lot of the time, a homeowner needs to contact four or five people to get a retrofit works done. We're trying to centralize that. So they go to one person, they get their BR assessment carried out. They have access to low cost finance, access to a range of subcontractors. All those things come together so they don't hit a barrier that kind of puts them saying, okay, I'm not going to upgrade for another six, six months to a year. Uh, so we're trying to make it easier and it needs to happen if, we've to, if, we, if we meet our targets. Um, this just is a, a slide I put in just to see the scale of the challenge. Apologies, the, ski, the, the slide is a bit blurry, but if you see the table at the bottom, we're here now in 2020 and we, um, we're, we're challenged to deliver 3,500. At the end of next year, it's 13,000. Um, and you can see the massive jump there. Then 2020, we're looking at 33,000. And then it plateaus at 2023 at 55,000 and on up to 2030. So the task is immense. And it's not just finding the homeowners to do this, it's, it's finding the skilled labor that can actually deliver it at scale. Um, so that just gives you a sense of the, the, the challenge ahead of us. Um, 
then how do I how do I re retrofit my home? So similar to what Barry was saying, SEI's fabric first philosophy underpins our scheme delivery and that's across the board in all our schemes. You reduce the heat demand first. That's the number one priority. The last thing you want to see is someone putting in a new uh, condensing boiler uh, without having addressed the fabric because the heat loss uh, from the envelope will be the same. Um, the challenges when it comes to engaging homeowners, be it urban or uh, rural, there's a strong draw towards traditional methods and holding on to these such as the open fire, which is we all know is like 30% efficient or they've access to their own solid fuel supplies that kind of top up the central heating systems. And in rural areas that they, they could have, they could have plots of turf that they bring in for the winter. And um, this isn't so much a problem in urban setting, but it's, it's scattered throughout the country in terms of rural settings. So, and in my time on the warmer home scheme, which kind of delivered, delivered energy, um, upgrade works to energy poor homes like we come across people who are tied to these forms of methods in terms of they know nothing else but working with an open fire or having a range in the house and that's a central part of the home where everyone gathers so all this dynamic and social awareness of the whole thing it makes it harder for the people on the ground to kind of drive the energy efficient agenda and to get it into people's psychic the benefits of moving to these new technologies such as promoting the health benefits linked to it and um, improving the environment as well so it's to create a, a positive conversation around the technologies and people feel more comfortable to make the transition and, and maybe it's just relying on informing the older generation through trusted parties such as their children or trust members of the community and um, through kind of a community-led scheme so that's just kind of in terms of what to do in terms of retrofitting the home. So it's, it's the fabric first and the heating system, which is a challenge. And then following that, then you're looking at solar PV and other renewable technologies. Um, so moving on then, just what, what is a heat pump? I won't spend too long on this. Um, just a schematic there. So you have your outdoor unit, which is your evaporator, and um, your indoor unit, which is your hot water cylinder. And this is kind of ran through the, if you see the diagram on the right, this is the science behind it. Um, so basically all air is absorbed um, through the, the evaporator and there's a, a refrigerant liquid within here in the evaporator section that, that has a very low boiling point. Um, so this creates a low pressure, low temperature vapor. Okay, and this goes through a compressor to increase the temperature even more. And this is what's brought into your hot water cylinder, say in a split system. And this heats the water in your cylinder and it, that's from the cylinder then the underfloor heating your rads are served and um, so it, it, this this kind of system in terms of rural setting it's it's very good in terms of like there's no problem in terms of finding places to install it there's kind of options to do um uh, ground heat pumps in terms of the area around you in terms of urban settings where you have lines of terraced homes and um, you could have unsightly units fixed to walls and so on. But that's a technology, as you, as you can see, it's, it's different to your, your typical heat pump, um, to your typical boiler technology. But this is what we're trying to sell and push the benefits of. And it, if you look on my next slide here, and just get the mouse to click it over. This is in terms of the high performance and the efficiency of a heat pump one unit of electricity going into a, a heat pump and three units of free air gives you four units of heat in the dwelling. So basically that generates your, that generates your efficiency of a heat pump of 350% as opposed to your oil or gas boiler, which you have one unit of thermal heat generating um, 0.85 units of energy in your house. So you can see straight away the, the efficiencies you're getting there. Um, but it's understanding when to apply this technology. So um, in SEI, we, we, when we implemented it first, we feared the case where homeowners put heat pump technology into homes that weren't suitable. So we, we have this term heat pump ready, um, where you need to understand the energy performance of the building fabric. Um, and this is critical for the, the heat pump to run efficiently. So one like a boiler, the heat pump is ready to provide heat continuously. Um, so there's no clicking on and off of a, say on a traditional boiler. So where rooms are set at particular temperatures, be it 18 degrees for um, 
downstairs room or 21 in, in bedrooms or so. When the, when the temperature in those rooms go below those, temp, those degrees, it'll call heat from the, the heat pump. So with that in mind, it's critical that the heat loss indicator, the heat loss to the fabric and ventilation is kept at a minimum because we don't want the heat pump running continuously. Now, one of our main technical standards that we have before we ever grant aid or support a heat pump being installed in a home is that the heat loss indicator in the property is um, equal to or less than two watts per Kelvin meter squared. Um, and we have a, a backstop value of 2.3 under specific conditions. Um, and that basically sums up through, through our deep software, the fabric heat losses and the ventilation heat losses in the dwelling per meter squared of the floor. So it keeps us in a safe place in terms of people installing heat. Our home is adequately insulated and airtight. So they're experiencing the energy savings they, sh they should. Um, in terms of heat pumps, as, as you probably all know as well, they operate at a low temperature. So instead of your radiators being piping hot, like through a, a normal oil boiler system or gas boiler system where you can be drying your clothes or whatever, the temperature on the, in the rads is lower. It's about 35 degrees. So therefore you're getting much better efficiency. But with that, it comes a point where you need to assess the radiators in your, in your house because there's less heat coming from the radiators, the radiators may need to be resized for a larger area. And um, so that's, that's extra cost. Now I'll come onto a slide on cost, but there's, there's little things associated with heat pumps that, that kind of make it a bit more challenging. Um, and then ultimately, it's just reinforcing what Barry was saying in terms of the standards. So it needs to be installed by competent um, installers and it needs to be commissioned because I think we all know the stories where heat pump technologies was installed and test done with the energy savings trust where they weren't meeting half their efficiencies as they should have. And um, if any of you are interested, we have SEI have homeowners guide to heat pump systems um, on their website and we have our technical specification there. And um, I think we could be circulating this. So you'll see if you type in SEI and then the words there for the tech spec or the homeowners guide, you'll see for more information on it. Um, okay, so the typical cost, so the scheme I'm running now is a National Home Retrofit Scheme and to date we have about 800, um, 805 homes in looking for support, so we've, it's about 15 and a half million, we're hoping to get to 21.5 grant aid monies allocated now before the end of January, but I kind of singled out, between all the applications we were getting, uh, I singled out kind of a rural property and this has a floor area of say 130 meters squared, it's detached and it's two stories. So it's probably common scattering of homes you'd get in rural Ireland. Um, so the roof insulation, it's coming in, so 65 meters squared, so it's half of 130. It's coming in the order of 750 to 1800. Now the, the, the price difference there is that roof ventilation needs to be incorporated um, as our SR54, a code of practice. So that, that can add extra cost into the roof insulation. External wall insulation, we all know it's, it's an expensive measure. Um, if you have solid walls, it's, it's hard to get away from it. If that was cavity wall insulation, you could be looking at uh, 16K less there. And uh, windows and doors to be upgraded. So you're looking at an average nine and a half to 12K. The heat pump, we're seeing 11K roughly, but then there's, there's additional costs required for RADs and the associated pipe work. So you could be looking at another 1,500, two grand there. Then always advisable an air tightness test. So it's great if we get to the five meters cubed per hour per meter squared, and then it's followed on by a kind of a healthy ventilation strategy, be it DCV or mechanical ventilation. So then the key, the fabric first on the right hand side, the fabric first, then we're decarbonizing the heat, then we're implementing a, a ventilation strategy. And we're kind of coming in on average 48K per home. Um, and then there's a, a PM fee on top of that to manage it and bring it in. So this, this is kind of, um, this is where we're at. And um, we have a bit of a lag. There was a drive and a pilot scheme where they had to get to A3. So we're trying to bring the market back and say, you're going out selling this to homeowners. It's selling the B2 upgrade as opposed to the A3. Um, and, and make it more feasible for a homeowner to proceed with the works. So it, it's expensive either way. Um, now to look at, look at the payback in terms of for a heat pump. 
Um, I think if I look at the last slide, 48K, like that's a lifetime that you'd be looking at in terms of payback for the overall upgrade. But singling out the heat pump side of things, if I looked at a relatively poor insulated home, their energy consumption would be kind of in the order of, of 30,000 to 28,000 kilowatt hours per year with a, with a boiler with an efficiency of 75% and say 85% of that is going towards the heating side. So you could be looking at an existing energy usage of um, about 36 kilowatt hours uh, per year, 36,000 kilowatt hours per year, which gives you an energy cost of 27, 2800. Okay, looking at the fabric and your heat glasses and implementing the fabric insulation and the attic insulation, you're bringing your heat gloss and watts down to 2800 um, and reducing your heat demand to 20,000, you can see in the table there. And if you divide that by the energy efficiency of a heat pump, your overall kilowatt hours per year is coming down around the 10,000 kilowatt hours per year mark. If you add the two, bullet, if you add the bullet point of 4,200 and 5,850. Five, so your bill is, is in the order of 1800. So you have a 950 reduction, um, which is a 35% reduction. And if it costs 12,000 to install the heat pump, you're looking at a nine year payback with 35% grant or, or 13 to 14 year payback without it. So the more energy inefficient your home is as well, the payback would be quicker. So it's just to give you an idea of what you're looking at in terms of payback. The benefits and drivers is that for heat pumps and a well insulated home, as opposed to poor insulated home and oil boilers, is that you're improving the overall comfort of the home. So you're getting the, the internal temperature to a stable amount. There's health benefits there, such as we have the warmth and well being scheme, which kind of off in New Zealand, of all places, and they've identified the health benefits and the reduction on demand on hospital beds. Um, as a result of it, um, from, insulated, from well insulated homes and ventilated homes with people who suffer from COPD. Um, and then you have the, the obvious ones like the reduced CO2 emissions and the energy security. Um, there's just a, a brief snap on our residential renewable installs since 2018. Pre 2018, we had renewables, but it was also through our green, greener home scheme. But from 2018 onwards, you can see the extent of what we're upgrading. Um, the Better Energy Homes grant scheme, you can see air to water heat pumps on the, the table on the top left is flying ahead at 984 installs. Um, our deep retrofit scheme at the bottom right has 700, it will at the end of it have 570 A3 homes uh, brought up to standard and all of them would have received a heat pump. And we've Better Energy Communities on the top right, it kind of just documents the, the level of renewables installs we've had on the home side of the better energy communities. Um, just moving on then to solar PV. Um, the scheme we have from the earlier slide, we, we've kind of um, administered 4,300 4, solar PV grants. And that's the support that we give. So solar PV up to two kilowatt peaks is a grant of 900 uh, euro per kilowatt peak and, and so on. But in, in general, what we try to promote in terms of solar PV is, is its, its size and measured in terms of self-consumption. Um, so ultimately to get the most out of a solar PV system is what you generate, you need to use and you should use. Anything above that, it's not real good value for money unless you implement, uh, if, unless you introduce battery storage. Um, and also in terms of solar PV, it's kind of a simple technology to understand in terms of homeowners have monitors in their house monitoring their electrical generation and they can apply their smarts by turning on appliances when they can see in the monitor the, the uh, energy generation is high at a particular time of the day. So that's just a bit on our solar um, PV scheme. Um, as I was saying, match generation to demand. Our average system is six panels. Um, so it's a two kilowatt peak system. It will reduce your electricity bill for an average home of 300 per year. Um, there's added costs that will, will increase your payback, such as um, hot water diverters, which, which channel your energy into heating your water in your cylinder and so on. And it's important that it's designed right in terms of the angles it's facing, eliminating shading. Um, and as I said, in terms of the smarter home side, that people kind of tend to 
be aware of the energy they're generating and, and they do kind of apply their, their tasks for the day to when the, the demand is high, which is great to see. And it's, it's more and more of that that we need. Um, and then it's just on the payback in terms of a uh, two kilowatt peak system um, that we're seeing, it's probably nine to 10 years with the SEI grant. Um, and like there's key factors there. I think it's more relevant in, in non-domestic upgrades that the roof condition needs to be in, in a good condition. We've had a number of BEC projects that had to be shelved because um, they, had, they had applied for support for solar PV, but when they went out and did the engineering analysis on the structure, it wasn't suitable to take it. Um, maybe on, on houses, it's more kind of a known entity, but a non-domestic can be a, a problem. Um, so that's just that. And on our, our website, if, you, if you're interested in it, if you go into SEI, Solar PV Payback, there's a calculator there where you can put in kind of five or six parameters um, in terms of where you live, where you're, what way your roof is facing, if you've got a quote from an installer, and it'll give you an idea of the payback. Um, so if you enter into a contract, you'll know, okay, I'll, I'll have my money back within eight, nine, 10 years. So it's, it's just a bit of a, a tool we use so you can go out in there kind of with information to hand and you know, I suppose the payback period in your investment. So just to finish up a bit on um, EVs, it's not really my expert, uh, area of expertise, but it's growing um, big time. I know we have high-end cars there like the Tesla, but we have the, the Leaf and Golf are bringing bringing new models out all the time. And we have grants that, that support commercial vans and private homeowners. And, and in these cases, uh, you apply via your car dealer, but in terms of the, the extent of the grants, so if it's anything greater than, it's anything than 20K, which a lot of them are at the minute because the, the second market isn't really, um, well, we're growing at the time, there's a grant there of, of 5K. So there's other discounts in terms of discounts for tolls benefit and kind discounts and so on. Um, and then also in terms of um, getting charges installed in your home, like there's a grant of 600 euros. So that I and I think from, from talking to people that nearly, that nearly covers the cost of it nearly. So it's a very kind of highly incentive, incentive uh, grant. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot tour of, of where we were at and kind of, I know I focused mainly on um, heat pumps and, and solar PV, but um, given our climate action plan targets and their focus on hitting that renewable heat target and driving it, um, like the majority of, of upgrades we're doing now, it's all fabric first, and we're looking at uh, heat pump technology then on top of that, um, and so on. So that's me. If, if, if there's any questions, I hope you found it somewhat useful um, and, and applicable, you know. Stephen, thank you very much. I think it's just at the moment, I'm sure that more questions will come, but there's, there's one question there from a colleague in the house out of Andy Free, which you, you, can, you can email him yeah. offline or we can have a, have a chat and hopefully in the Q&A session. But thank you very much, Stephen. Just no to problem. recap, he's looked at Fabric First. He's looked at the fact that the down south, they're actually live a plan and they're moving forward. They want them to do 1,500 houses this year. Only one quick question about for you, Stephen, and, yeah. and it's a bit of a random one. Can we ever equate the B2 to the UK SAP model? So in other words, would B2 be equivalent to a high B, low SAP band A? Would you have an idea? I know it's a different metric. It's, it's a different metric and there's all different variables like in the, in the deep software that you're probably familiar with, there's, there's so many input points in terms of, but like there would have to be, ultimately we're trying to get to the same goal where there's a cost optimal uh, solution there for the homeowner where they don't have to pay 60k to bring their home up to a up to a, a good energy standard where it's something in the middle of 30 to 40k and that's a good long-term position to stay in and they're, they're energy efficient and anything they pay above that their savings wouldn't really generate it wouldn't generate savings so i would imagine if the parameters are very similar you, you could align it if, if you if you looked at the two of them side by side but it would make sense that they would align uh, robert I was just a bit more energetic. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, for that, Stephen. And just, just sort of to reiterate some of the points Stephen made, yes, down south, they're up and going. There's an issue there about behaviour change, but then I also point out to you, if you start getting the technology, people start using it. So if you've got a time clock that uses an app, people will start playing with it and then use 
use the electricity one has been generated. Some of our key points, heat pumps for rural areas coming through very strong, solar plus electric storage or storage of any sort. Uh, but the things, they've, they've got better policy levers in the Republic of Ireland. They've got a Climate Change Act of sorts. They've got an energy policy. They've got good building regulations, which got good performance standards, and they've also got, got uh, more, more, more funding. But Stephen, thank you, and we'll, um, we'll come back to you during the question and answer session. Oh, I'm going to try and share my screen now, uh, see if this will work. Okay, whoa. Yeah, I think we're on the first time. So I'll just go through to the uh, pilot. So, okay, yeah. So I'm just now gonna have a quick chat for 10 minutes about the hand heat pilot. Uh, so as I told you earlier on, there's four work streams inside the hand heat project uh, and there's two pilots involved. Uh, there's a pilot in Finland, which is looking at biogas and how you use biogas in remote rural areas. And then there's also a pilot in Fermanagh where we're looking at electrification of heat with a level of energy efficiency because low carbon heating and energy efficiency are two sides of the, of the same coin. And that's a very, very key message. Uh, some background, yeah, we've, we all know about the Climate Change Act. The UK is one of the first G7 countries to come out of the blocks with regard to looking for net zero. In Northern Ireland, we've got the energy strategy. Um, we're looking at the draft policy coming out in March or April for a, for a full consultation on over the summertime. Um, Northern Ireland and energy, we can't not talk about RHA. Um, the issue for the energy and energy efficiency market, and it has stalled the appetite for going forward with this year, and it has had an impact whether we like it or not. Um, the bottom picture here shows a picture of Europe, uh, which was a... Um, Piece of work done by uh, Tata, Tato. They're looking at the energy efficiency levels in housing. And basically, what they showed was uh, Britain has fairly leaky uh, levels of energy efficiency, and that affects uh, ultimately one of the key issues for us is fuel poverty. Fuel poverty says is sitting in around 22% in Northern Ireland, so it's one in five people, which is clearly unacceptable. Uh, and that would be the main thrust on what we're looking at. Some other big strategic players, which are hopefully make a difference. Uh, the UK government uh, Prime Minister announced a 10 point plan for his green revolution. Yes, our energy is a devolved matter, but, but everything that goes through England eventually gets its way across the Irish Sea. We talked about the impending uh, non iron energy strategy. The Committee of Climate Change, which is a strategic advisor for the, uh, to the UK government about climate change, they are bringing out their sixth carbon budget in two weeks time. But again, one of their big points is they want to see 60% of the heavy lifting done inside the next 10 years. They believe the UK should be spending 50 billion pounds per year on climate change mitigation. What does that mean? That means Plastic Northern Ireland is not spending enough on putting in energy efficiency measures. And uh, that is one of sort of our, our, our key outputs. But again, taking all that on board, we wanted to put in pilots, into houses in Northern Ireland and to look at heating and to look at energy efficiency. So really keeping it very, very simple. And just one other slide here. If we are to see the 60% change in the next 10 years, if we are to see 50 billion pounds spent every year across the UK and whatever the equivalent of that is for NA, you're talking a serious amount of wind turbines, electric cars, and some form of uh, heating and showing the heat pumps. Um, they're not, I think they're 26,000 installed last year, which is well beneath the target of 600. But they are putting in lots of gas boilers, so it can be done. So I'm just trying to, this slide is showing a lot of work to do, but if there's leadership, if there's funding, and if there's a skills program, these things can happen. So putting all that big mix together, we really wanted to come back. And what do we want to do? We want to try and put energy efficiency into houses, put in some form of low, uh, low cost heating, especially in rural areas. And that we're really looking at the Climate Change Committee's uh, report in 2019. That really looks at electrification of the heating of the gas grid as the simplest option. For energy efficiency, again, the Houses Edit is a, is a strategic housing authority that will rate 6,000 houses, 10% of the NA stock. 
So any model would have to be scalable. Yes, there's been models down south, uh, Super Homes NIE, Temporary Energy Company has done excellent, excellent work, but they are putting in deep retrofit, they're putting in uh, very high measures. What this project aimed to look at was trying to get energy efficiency and under the 10,000 pound to give um, a thermal envelope to the house and to put in whatever heating was required after that there. So that was the sort of the premise. Another key thing was make the technology work for the householder, don't make the householder work for the technology. Uh, so we found a scheme, um, it's a house out of scheme in, in Fermanagh, I'm not going to name it because we have vast attempts obviously. Uh, it's typical of, of social housing that we have across Northern Ireland and indeed the, the north of Ireland as a whole. Um, we have an issue, COVID, yes, has slipped our timeline slightly. We're meant to get kit in at the start of um, summertime. Didn't happen, but we've, we've now got nearly all the kit in. The intention is to get data monitoring with, with, with us, the university. So what do we look at? Typical social housing, County Fermanagh. There you have it, um, built in late 70s, early 80s, cavity wall, 40 mil uh, cavity wall, probably no insulation in it. Uh, double glazing to a U value 1.4. What's that? That's an average level of, of double glazing. Um, air tightness in double figures easily. Um, you're talking way over 10 to 15, but it's, it's, it's air tightness was never a, never a requirement in building regulations up until a recent pilots for the house edit. Never really was part of the agenda, but since passive and since the house edit have got a fair few staff into the passive course, we get it. We, we get the air tightness, we, we get the insulation, we get the uh, low, 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 low carbon heating. So that's, that's what, what the, um, the project was all trying to look at. So um, we've got two houses with, with hybrid um, oil and air source heat pumps. We've got one house which has got a hybrid immersion and we've got two houses in with electric generation and storage and electric heating. And we'll talk through them. But just before we do that, I just want to have a quick mention, probably go back to last slide, about the level of energy efficiency. So the aim was to try and get the house up to a SAP band C. What does that mean? That means you're going to have to spend on average about £10,000. We think we're going to come in about £8,000 based on current contractual rates. But what we're doing is putting on a thermal envelope to the houses. Um, just that somewhere. So for the walls, we want to put in cavity wall insulation, which is, which is bonded bead. We want to put in an eaves insulation and get the detail and then put in 400 mil loft insulation. What is that trying to do? We're trying to put a thermal envelope around the house uh, as best we can. Uh, we're wanting to fit windows to the best double glazing levels we can get. Why are we doing that? Because at the moment, triple glazing is not yet seen as a, as a standard and there's only an extra two set points, but we're putting in 1.0 uh, U value for double glazing windows and frames, which is only 0.2 above triple glazing. We're fitting up to pacify standards. We're using aerogel and PAR to seal the windows. So sealing the windows is very, very important. Trying to get a certain level of air tightness. Now, a non-intrusive level of air tightness for a tenant who's still living in the house. You have to work around the household and that's key. So we're, looked at, we're looking at the weak points. So if you see them houses, above the front doors, there's cold bridging. So we have put PAR in there. We've got uh, extra insulation in the eaves as well to try and get the thermal envelope, as you said. But we're looking at the really simple areas where there is severe levels of uh, air tightness leakage. Uh, we couldn't get a pre-works uh, air tightness test because of COVID, but we intend to get a post one, so we'll be interested to see what that figures. But basically, the energy efficiency, we looked at walls, we looked at windows, and we looked at air tightness, and trying to put, get them at a decent thermal envelope. If we now move on then to the, the different options we picked. So the first one is called a hybrid air source heat pump oil boiler. It's effectively a small air source heat pump with an existing oil boiler. With a six kilowatt air source heat pump, again, these houses, if we've got them up to a SAP band C, um, so we're not wanting to do a deep retrofit, as Stephen talked about, going up to a B2, which I would see as a, as a high level B or a low level SAP band D or band A, sorry. And the key is making the technology work for the householder. So we put in larger rods throughout the whole house. It just doesn't look up, but this is definitely a larger rod and, and, and all the rooms with the, with the householders have definitely noticed. We're making the householder use heating for about two to three to four hours a day, as opposed to putting on to one hour at a time to get a level of heat in the house. We're not advocating the tenants of the heating on 
10 or 12 hours a day. That's not the behavior. We must make a technology work around that. The technology came from Grant down in, in Burr and I'd say that's loan. Uh, and they, they were there at the moment, we're trialing us here, we're, we're collecting the data and to see where it's coming from. But to see what this looks like visually, it's effectively an air source heat pump, a brain, which they call an evil link, and a fairly large hot water cylinder. The end state you end up with this uh, scenario at the back of the house. So you've got your existing oil boiler, this is the silver box. You've got the air source heat pump, it's the box with the, the big white circle on, and then you've got the brain called the evil link at the top. And the basic premise is that the brain will give primacy to the air source heat pump whenever the ambient temperature is above four degrees. And then the oil boiler will be used whenever it is under four degrees. Why do you do that? Because air source heat pumps work on outside temperatures and at low temperatures, it isn't that efficient. There's a coefficient of, of four to one. Effectively, if you look at the stuff from Temporary Energy Company, the data shows the coefficient is about 2.5 to one. So the aim here is to cut down carbon and to keep the household bills at the same level. Uh, we've only had them in for a month and there's nothing to say that that hypothesis isn't going to be answered. Uh, the various levels of data we'll collect it later on. We're using data spaces, we're using Austin University and the various bits of kit that we use has got monitoring data on as well. So the view is that we'll monitor this over a one to two year period and then uh, release it through open source but basically give the conclusion, does this work? And we do believe that it should work. Um, so that really is the, the first option that we had. The second option is an immersion oil boiler. It's, it's, it's a bit more low key. There's, if you see the example there, they've got three immersions, three three kilowatt immersions fitted. We're not doing it. We're only fitting one three kilowatt immersion and has been connected into the bottom of the, of the uh, heat exchanger. It's based on the model of an IGL tariff. We haven't got an IGL tariff in Northern Ireland yet, but we have the uh, GB uh, and get Patrick to mute there, please. Uh, but the, the view is that we want to try and model it. And the view is that with the stuff Patrick talked about later on, we want to get people cheap heat or cheap hot water for one to two hours a day. So we're modeling based on that there. So we're looking at the household behavior. We've got a big picture of one of our point of contact is there, H&A. And why have, we, why have we got that on? We're trying to show this kit must be fitted by mainstream contractors. h and is, is one of our appointed contractors. They're probably one of the biggest in uh, Northern Ireland. But we're trying to make the point this kit can be fitted by mainstream plumbers. Um, and that's, that's the idea of putting that on there. So the idea is here, uh, this is cheaper than all the other options. It's just, an, it's just a heavy duty immersion. But if we get an agile tariff, it's basically, it's basically game on, but it's more of an evolution. There is one house, which is a control house, it's just got a state oil boiler, measuring the data. So if you count, we're now up to four. And here's the last two. So this is electrification, about generation and about uh, storage, and then using uh, direct heating. This comes from a, one of our associate partners, the electric storage company. They're probably better known for their, one of the lead partners in Girona which is a, a 2.4 million pound Innovate UK contract uh, research project that they're doing up in Korean. But in our wee world here, um, they're, they're, they're putting the kit into two houses first. So it's a bit looking at generation, it's a bit looking at storage, and a bit looking at heating. And, and the view is, can that model work? Yes, the kit, the, the, the battery storage is expensive at the moment. PV isn't, PV is uh, easily 1,000 pound a kilowatt uh, to purchase. Uh, and if, so if you look at the grants down south, 900 euros, like that's, that's, a, that's a fairly attractive grant. But uh, this has been in, the PV has been on there for a few months. We're, we're getting the storage batteries fitted in the next week or two and the electric uh, heating and get them into the heating season to, to work with tenants. All these systems are all fairly autonomous. There's no having tenants to have to do anything. It's about the tenants working, uh, working away with their busy lives, doing whatever they're doing and not having a pile of time to be an early adopter and, and to play about with kit. And that is a, is a key message. Um, so we've now looked at the hybrid, looked at the immersion, we've looked at the electric generation storage and electric heating. We're now looking how we're measuring all this stuff. So we've got data loggers from Grant, we've got data loggers from Sonnen, which is the electric um, storage company's preferred battery. And we have got uh, heat flow uh, meters as well. We suck all that into Austin University. They have got PhD researchers of sorrow, and so it's actually the guy dealing with this. Uh, they will pump out an impartial view on the whole thing, but the hypothesis is there that it should work. Uh, we will have 
announce this at our hot heat final conference, which will be in September, but we will keep rolling the data on for, for an, an another 12 months. But the whole idea here is to try and shape the Hyazet's future heating policy, because at the moment we're putting in oil boilers. Uh, we've got, Northern Ireland's got 68% oil. We need to find solutions, uh, especially off the gas grid and some time for on the gas grid. But, but right now the immediate issue is off the gas grid, what do we do? Uh, and that's why we're looking at this here. So we're looking at value for money refurb, or we're looking at some forms of uh, low carbon heating. Now, hand heat was actually developed about two years ago as in the scoping out, and we have moved on in that there. And we need to realize this here and see what the work, but again, Patrick will talk about sort of, sort of future plans later. But this is very much a here and now. We think this works and we want to get the data to prove it. Um, where are we at right now? As you see there's a, there's a climate, what's that really telling you? We want to see systems fitted that householders can say, they can put on a, a time clock, climate, hive, nest, or equal or approved, all that good stuff. But climate is, um, has been assisting us in this here and assists some of the projects down south. They can put an app into their phone. Um, they can turn on the heating from Belfast if they're living in Derry, et cetera, et cetera. So we put on the climate uh, devices to all the houses in um, March. We have fitted the M&A stuff to four houses in October. The energy efficiency measures are actually been fitted right now. We're filling the electrical stuff in the next week or so, definitely before Christmas. The monitoring kicked off in October, and we'll see phase one of the data coming through in uh, September of next year, and then phase two will, 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 will be after that there. So we're expecting to show uh, how it's working. We're, we'll be speaking to householders, and that will be our asset test. Our asset test will be not the data coming from us university, the asset test will be the householders. And I'll just leave you with one thought. With all the views about, about heat pumps, after the, the kit was on one of the houses three weeks, I said, you know, this is, this is only going to be in for one year or two years. And then we'll be taking out again, leaving oil water. And the tenant says, no, you're not. And I says, I want that there. And that is, that is um, uh, as much praise as we want. We want people to accept and embrace um, carbon-free heating the next generation will, so the quicker we do it, the better, and, and get this place a, a more carbon-free world, the better. Um, I'm now going back onto the agenda here. Uh, with next speaker, I assume there can no burning questions. We can take them to the very end. Um, just stuck on Zenning, pop up there. No, it's not. Uh, next speaker is Patrick Kilte. Patrick's a senior lecturer at Austin University. I'm trying to find his notes here. He's sort of the data lead for our hand heat project. He also works with, or we're trying to scope out the roulette, which is our, our, our sort of future project. Um, he's also a senior lecturer and also trying to do an MSc, which is his day job. This is very much not his day job, but it is his passion. He will be one of the main speakers on energy systems, energy transition, and energy governance uh, in Northern Ireland. And to be fair to say, he's probably the best speaker on the subject matter. So we're very glad to have you, Patrick. I will stop thank sharing. Thank, thank, thank you, Robert. But, and uh, uh, I want to see the bottle of port and the, and the post. Very flap. generous. Very generous. Can I have a screen share, please? I'm. Uh, I, I mine's disabled at this end. Uh, who's got that? Sorry, there's something happening here because I had made you all co-hosts, but anyway, there you go. That's thanks. you again. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Uh, Okay, is that it? I take it that's you can you can all see that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, thanks very much for the introduction, Rob, and the bringing up. Uh, I don't know if it's very generous. I don't know if it's entirely true, but anyway. Um, so, uh, I'm a lecturer in uh, Centre for Sustainable Technologies uh, in Ulster University, and uh, we've been working in CST through the. Uh, and through the SPIRE 2 project, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit, we've been working uh, pretty closely with uh, the housing executive over the last couple of years. Uh, the, the SPIRE 2 project that I formerly worked on has looked at uh, distributed storage, what's called mass storage, as in mass market storage, effectively consumer owned storage, and that's uh, electrical storage and thermal storage. And uh, as we kind of got into that project's been running for nearly four years now, but as we get into it, a lot of the focus in the project was on tech, uh, developing technology. We realized that the problem was not 
technological development, it was market structures and business models and so on that were the problems. So that's been a kind of a key focus of the of the work since then. So just for uh, some concept, some of this will be, you know, will not be news to you at all, but just to sort of set the context for the for the work that we're doing in, in Roulette, which is rural led energy transition. Um, there's, a, there's an important distinction to, to note between when we talk about renewables, uh, people often talk about them as if they're one kind of form of generation. There's a big difference between what we call variable renewable energy like wind and solar and uh, renewables like biomass or uh, you know any biofuel which which you can use in the same way as you would use a fossil fuel or hydro or or even other low carbon generation like nuclear um it's very difficult to manage variable renewable energy because it's non-synchronous and because it's non-controllable but that's what we have lots of and what we that's what we've connected lots of on the island as a whole on the island of ireland um just to give you some uh, idea of how much of our renewables are variable that's the figures for 2020 so the targets for each of the synchronous systems so each of these columns is a separate standalone synchronous power system um and there's the the Irish systems the gb system there's the, this one here the continental synchronous area which is by far the most massive single standalone power grid in the world 400 and something million uh, individual loads, but it's it's massive. We're obviously a lot smaller than that. Scandinavia got a, a standalone grid, but in terms of connecting lots of VRE, lots of variable renewable energy, that the the target that we have on this island is is world leading, um, and because of that, we have uh, a kind of a groundbreaking uh, system services market in DS3. Um, but the challenges of integrating renewables here are quite different to to challenges in GB or in, or in the rest of Europe. Um, when you integrate and when you connect lots of variables, uh, variable renewables like wind and solar, you need flexibility because you've now got a generation source that creates variability. You, historically, variability came from consumer side, just came from changes in demand. Now you've got, you've added in generation that contributes to that and exacerbates that, uh, that, that, that problem. So you need more flexibility. You need a more flexible system to manage that. And that uh, flexibility can come from conventional fossil generation, uh, whether that's combined or open, open cycle gas units. It can come from interconnection. Uh, so you can interconnect with uh, different systems like the GB market or the Celtic interconnect, which will connect us with, with Europe. It can come from grid scale storage like pumped hydro, compressed air, hydrogen eventually for power potentially. The, all of those are investor owned resources. And the last one and the big one of the thing that we're really interested in in this project and that is kind of creating waves globally is demand side flexibility because that comes from consumers and that makes consumers actors in energy markets and that's a that's a massive change uh, and massive it's a you know source of massive disruption to established industry players. So in and I'm focused. This is uh, this is uh, some of this is specific to Northern Ireland. A lot of this is would be general for the island as a whole, but in Northern Ireland we need lots of local flexibility. Um, and the reason for that is because we we're coming we're starting from a system which had a peaky demand profile. So we had a lot of variability just from the kind of demand profile that we had because we have no large industrial base, we have no largely services and agricultural economy, but that. Uh, means you've got high peaks in demand and low troughs. We've got lots, and I'll show you, uh, there's another slide on this in a minute, lots and lots of small scale distribution connected VRE, wind and solar. So you may have seen the, the audit office report recently, which kind of pointed out the number or the, the, the incentives for small scale wind that they were in here. So we pay four times the rate that's paid the rest of the UK for small scale, but because of that, we have lots and lots of very small scale uh, generators connected to the system. If you look at this, this uh, um, map on the right, you can see the, these are wind farms across the UK. And uh, you'll see at first, no, no, we've got lots and lots of them, but also the, the, the size of those dots represents the scale of the wind farms. And 
you compare us to Scotland, for instance, Scotland has a lot of wind energy, but it's generally large scale connected at transmission voltage. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about what that means later on. We get lots of wire and um, three times the amount of uh, uh, distribution network uh, than the UK average. So we've got lots of highly variable demand and generation. And that's by the we graphic of VRE and flex, flexibility or peas in the pod. You add lots of renewable, variable renewables, you need lots of flexibility. And just to illustrate that again, this is a plot of wind connections in Northern Ireland since 1990. And this red line here is our minimum demand. That's the lowest demand that we get on our system, about 430 megawatts. And you can see that now there are lots of times when our wind capacity, if wind is blown at full tilt, we've got far more generation than our minimum demand. Um, and just to finish up on this, when you compare us with the South, and this is a, again to illustrate the point about the, the volume of small scale local generation that we have, this is transmission connected and distribution connected. Tra transmission systems, high voltage system, uh, 275 or uh, 110 kV and above here, and distribution is lower voltage. So more local, if you like, is a simpler way to say that when you compare uh, the south with us, it's about half and half in the south with high voltage and low voltage connected. Northern Ireland, 91% connected at network level. Okay, so a lot more small scale local wind. So I mentioned that we, uh, when you add lots of wind uh, or lots of variable generation to the system, you need to harness as much flexibility as you can. So, and the, the kind of the key element for us uh, and that is flexible demand. And um, when we look at how policy and regulation has developed since we started connecting wind um, and at large scale, you could sort of say since the early 2000s, they, we've been successful in connecting wind, but we haven't been successful in integrating it. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that we haven't put the, the flexibility of demand side to work. So, when we look at uh, on the right here, we've got the uh, policy levers, if you like, uh, that uh, are in the electricity recast directive, which we have to follow in Northern Ireland um, after Brexit because we're part of the all island market. We've got all these different areas of policy which haven't been developed here. So active consumers, citizen energy communities, flexibility and distribution systems, smart meters, dynamic price contracts, aggregation, all of this stuff, that, that policy has not been developed, despite the fact that we've connected lots and lots of wind. So we are a long way behind where we need to be. As a result of that, what we've got is a mismatch. So we've got decentralized, highly variable generation. Um, we've got a variable load profile as well. And we're trying to manage it with centralized, low flexibility resources. The result of that is that we've got lots of wind shedding so at the moment, what we do when we've got excess wind on the system is we dump it, throw it away. Um, so in the first six months of this year in Northern Ireland alone, we've dumped 295 gigawatt hours of wind energy. Okay, gigawatt hours, what does that mean? That's enough power for 100,000 homes for a year, um, or it's power and heat for around 40,000 uh, homes heated by heat pumps with a COP of three. That's, that's over six months. So we haven't got the figures for the year as a whole yet, but if that, um, it, it, you know, if we extrapolate that and that, that that's the, the sort of numbers we're looking at for this year, you're talking about power and heat for about 80,000 houses, almost the entire Northern Ireland housing executive stock, enough uh, energy to power and heat those houses for a year that we've, that we've dumped. Um, and also becoming other, uh, problems with just dumping wind and not harnessing consumer side resources is that you're locking consumers out of market access. One of the uh, points of the electricity directive is that you create a level playing field for consumers as actors in, in energy markets. Um, we're done, uh, because we didn't use that energy, we, we had to replace it with imported fossil fuels. So effectively we've, we've paid twice. Um, Comparison with what's what's happening in GB over the same period, even though GB hasn't 
uh, doesn't have the same problems with uh, or face the same challenges because they don't have the same level of VRE connected. These are um, products that are available in GB at the minute. So Agile Octopus is a, a dynamic tariff um, arrangement which sort of links uh, um, wholesale market prices direct directly with consumer loads. So Octopus, if any of you follow me, you know, Octopus customers get a notification, prices are going to be low, prices are going to occasionally be negative. Um, so they, they get a, a, a signal on their app, you know, switch loads on or plan to do uh, charge your vehicle or bake bread or whatever it is at specific times. And in some cases they're paid to do that. Uh, Good Energy have just uh, come up with a, a launched a, a heat pump tariff, um, you know, specifically to, to, to suit the operation of heat pumps. Ovo Energy uh, are doing trials with um, vehicle to grid uh, for electric vehicles. Um, and I put this link and this is worth watching. This is Zero Homes in, in Wales um, have launched, are, are about to build more of these uh, 2050 ready homes. So a lot's happening in GB. What's happening in Northern Ireland is there's lots of really, really, really brilliant research projects um, being led by Ulster University. Um, but these are research projects, these are market products, and this is part of the, the stuff that we're uh, trying to look at here. So Spire 2, uh, I mentioned already, and Handy Heat, we're doing work with the housing executive on the data analysis for that. Next step from that is rural-led energy transition. Um, and there are two elements to, to, to the Roulette project, Energy Cloud and uh, Roulette Agile. Um, I'll just mention briefly, uh, I'm, not, I'm not watching my time here, Rob, start with not me if I'm, if I'm kind of going over time, but... Um, yeah, keep going. Okay, so um, we've also, uh, we're, we're, at the moment we're developing a, a flexibility map. Um, I don't know if, if we have time, I'll, I'll try and show you it later on. So this is actually uh, Usaru, uh, uh, one of our PhD students uh, has developed this and what we, there are different layers in this map but what you're looking at here in, uh, in purple are what are known as the constraint groups within Northern Ireland. So I mentioned that whenever there's excess wind it's turned down, it's basically thrown away um, and there are two, two parts to that. One part is curtailment which happens uh, the whole way across the system, everywhere on the system um, and the other one is constraints, and constraints are local. And in Northern Ireland, we've got four constraint groups. One of them is Northern Ireland as a whole, and that constraint is due to the fact that we don't have the north-south interconnector. So that there's times when we've got so much wind generated here that you know could be taken up in uh, in the south, but we can't uh, you know, we can't we can't export it. We can't get it out, so it gets turned down. Locally, there's also one on the north coast. This constraint group one. And in the West, there are two nested. So you've got constraint group two and constraint group three, both nested around Tyrone and Fermanagh uh, and centered around Oma. So you get two overlaid constraints. So you get much higher levels of constraint in that part of uh, Northern Ireland. Hence, rural led energy transition, because that's where most of the value lies in, uh, in absorbing that, that constrained wind, which would be otherwise, otherwise be dumped. Um, as you mentioned also on the map, we've, uh, we're linking this with social deprivation. So uh, we've a layer on the map with the social deprivation index. Um, uh, and again, related to fuel poverty, high levels of fuel poverty uh, and social need in the West, where we've also got lots of wind being thrown away. Um, we've also got on the map here, we've got uh, wind farms, um, substations, NIE network substations, um, which are out of capacity, um, uh, so that, that, that you, could, where you could use smart solutions like uh, local consumption of wind to relieve stress on the, the network and congestion on the network, <clears throat> and a bunch of other layers that we're, we're trying to bring in. And these are the three case studies that we, we have. So we're, we're working on case studies. There's another one being developed in Belfast at the minute. If we get time, we'll get a, a longer look at that at the end. So Roulette has kind of come out of um, our work in Handy Heat with the housing executive and partly from Spire 2. So um, Spire 2 is the uh, Interreg funded project um, that's been going for a few years now. And some of the partners from that are now in Roulette and there's some partners that have come out of Handy Heat. But the, so the main partners anyway in the 
project aspire to the housing executive and we, we, the, the lead organizations in this. Um, other partners, NIE Networks, working very closely with, um, again, on network congestion management. And this is you know, part of their transition to be a DSO, a system operator rather than a network operator. Climb, who Rob's mentioned, Sunamp, uh, our Spire 2 partner, who make uh, heat storage batteries uh, using phase change materials. And they're basically, uh, it's a way to get a lot of storage in a small space and uh, storage that doesn't lose heat in the same way that water tanks do. Grant, who make the hybrid uh, heat pumps that uh, Rob was describing, Energia, and Par and I, who are bringing an agile tariff to it and system operator Sony. So the elements um, of Roulette and the, the project design is based on six houses that will be heated with the Grant hybrid system that's already been trialed uh, in Handy Heat. But we're also going to add in to that the <clears throat> instead of using ordinary oil, uh, we, we'll use 50% uh, and 100% bio oil mix and gas. So we're going to run this, uh, compare this with, uh, install this, it can be installed in a house with gas boilers as well. Um, four houses will have the sun amp and a standalone heat pump. And uh, so I, for I forgot somebody mentioned there, heat pump ready. That's you know, identifying the houses that will that will be suitable for that, probably uh, mid-terrace houses. Um, so the Spire 2 budget's covering those technologies and then there's the fabric upgrades. Um, and I think that number is about right, Rob, is it eight to 10K per house is the, is the sort of number we're aiming at. So and it's kind of, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. Something like, so, so what it's looking at is, again, we're looking for an economic sweet spot. You know, how do we get maximum three things, maximum reduction in emissions, maximum market access for housing tenants, um, and at least cost is the sweet spot. So the roulette side of it, the agile tariff is based on the day ahead market. And this is uh, energy at par and uh, part of the project. And what will happen is that the tenants will be economy seven customers, but they will be given a schedule based on prices in the, the day ahead market. So typically at nighttime, that can mean electricity prices, including additional costs of sort of 5p, 6p per kilowatt hour. And during daytime, you know, 7p to 9p. And the, the schedule, the day ahead market schedule will be produced and by energy and the heat pumps will run on that schedule and storage will be charged and, and preheat will, uh, the heat buildings will be preheated. Um, where the day ahead market is cheaper than economy seven, the tenants will get the credit and get the money back. Um, the other part of it is energy cloud, and that is specifically directed at curtailed and constrained wind. So what that's proposing is that where there are existing immersion heaters and hot water storage tanks uh, in, in housing executive homes, they'll be switched on and the tenants would get uh, free hot water. So that will be provided uh, through by a signal from the system operator to relay switches in those homes. And rather than throwing that, uh, that, that energy away, that, that wind will be used to, to heat storage tanks and IHG stores. That will be free to tenants and it will be any money that's generated through that by the, the participating organizations that will go back into the uh, the costs so it will be a not-for-profit venture and the priority and that will be vulnerable households so we'll be trying to look for the most vulnerable households and get them at the, the top of the queue and that's kind of the overall aim of the project is is or one of the the, the kind of key aims of this is that as, as we get things like agile tariffs that you've already seen in GB there's a risk that they become middle class subsidies and people who can afford to buy PV or EVs or heat pumps for thermal storage, take advantage of tariffs like Octopus Agile or whatever, that then creates a risk of people being left behind. So what do you do if you're a, you're a non-homeowner or you don't have access to capital? And that you know, this is where we're in some ways, because we're so far behind, we're in quite a good situation because there's an opportunity here to promote people who would otherwise be at risk of being left behind to the head of the queue. Um, and if we if we can create these tariffs for social homes and prioritise vulnerable households, 
that'll go quite a long way, I think, to removing that risk of people being being left behind. Okay, uh, I don't know how long that was. That's the high level overview of the project. Patrick, thank you very much. That's perfect. I just started to recap. Patrick has basically gives the um, opportunities opportunities that we have, uh, as it says, with one um, Ireland was one is like what hydro is to uh, Norway. It is an opportunity that we have to try and exploit. Uh, and we want to try and help the vulnerable uh, fuel poor social housing uh, part of the market. Uh, and that's, that is the ambition here. So handy to trying to get the basics right, uh, technology, which is fairly much proven. And then the key thing out of roulette is the, we're scoping out, is looking for agile tariffs and trying to get the one curtailment. At the moment, that is us now as far as uh, question and answer session. And I'm just going to look. Yeah, that's my dog. That's now the cue to say this is sort of the question and answer session. We have in total 48 people still actually joined it. It's crept up from the start. Um, so if anybody has any questions, really at the moment, there's been questions from Lucy Cahorn has been answered. Jerry from Spire 2 has been answered. Ryan. Um, answered his question. Colin Lavery, Andy Frew asked a couple of questions. Andy Frew's got one last, or one question, Patrick, uh, and which we'll kick off with Andy's question, and then we'll just open to the floor. Andy asked, with one surplus is seasonal, do you need to think about turning up the demand for hot water uh, and for heating? So in other words, when the one, the one does their use it, but what do we do whenever the one turbine traditionally are at, at a low ebb, which in around sort of February and March time, uh, as a replaced for batteries, I'll kick off. Yes, there's a place for batteries because that's why we're looking at it in hand heat. Uh, that batteries with generation. So batteries can only work if you got a if you got a PV system there to generate with it. Uh, but Patrick, I'll, I'll maybe let you and then Barry or Stephen because Stephen's actually physically doing to the moment down south. So yeah, uh, Patrick, for, you know, I'll kick off with you first, and we'll we'll throw it over to Stephen. Oh, okay, so uh, for that we're we're looking at long term storage or, or potentially seasonal storage, which is in terms of research is a pretty hot area at the moment. So do you, I guess the question is, what do you, what form of storage are you talking about? Are you talking about uh, aquifer storage or are you talking about energy storage with hydrogen, for instance, for power? Um, <clears throat> where you would use, uh, you know, in power stations, uh, when there's excess wind during summertime because hydrogen is lost so you could you could put electrolyzers and hearts and power stations and store that and use that electricity to drive your heat pumps whenever there's uh whenever wind isn't available um and again the the, the seasonal thermal storage is a is a you know a fairly big area of research but i, I you know like a lot of things there's, there's nobody really looking at that but that you know we're talking quite a long way down the line um you know, we don't have Patrick, I'm not actually talking about mm. seasonal storage. I'm talking about displacing the use of the oil, uh, the oil that's in people's tanks in their back garden by directing excess wind, essentially via the immersion heater to hot water and potentially to living rooms and to the rest of the heating system. So in terms of getting, displacing more carbon more quickly and maintaining the pace of wind energy development, uh, I, do you think that's do you think that's more promising in terms of a short term, uh, short term thing? Yeah, what I'd like to see on that <clears throat> is a target for right. We we throw away we're we're ahead of eighteen percent of our wind energy. I'd like to see instead of a target for eighty percent connected generation, we're not managing what we've got. You know, we're managing it very badly. I would like a target for minimizing waste. So instead of wasting 18%, we'll say, well, whenever you look at integration of wind elsewhere, the, the, there will always be some level of curtailment, maybe two or 3%. 5% is when people start to get edgy about it, but we're, we're just off the scale. 18%, what do you mean? That's just a massive, massive waste. I would like to see a target for that to be minimized. And I would like to see social housing tenants prioritized in that, in that target being the first tool that we use to to soak up that excess wind. I don't know, does that answer that? Okay. Stephen, do you have anything to add there? Because I've 
just a question here from Jimmy. Just so maybe open the open that to Stephen. Just first there. No, no, no. I I generally agree with Patrick there. Um, I suppose it's, it's similar to to solar PV, like uh, access energy that's generated like there's hot water diverters there that can store some of the excess electricity generated um, and channel it into the immersion but no 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 nothing to add on that and like i would agree like the challenges are mirrored down south as well and it's, it's utilizing it's utilizing as much wind electricity as we can given the given the volume we have and i suppose in terms of the wind turbines and the wind farms is is kind of making them more efficient basically and get more value for money okay i just there's a question here from from jimmy delargue he's one of our uh, more seasoned commentators uh, in non ireland um, and he's he's a best i would call him an expert in energy jimmy says a few weeks ago we had a period of several days where wind energy is very limited uh, output actually went negative at one point unusual weather, but it could happen again where do we get our power from in these circumstances Batteries wouldn't hold enough. Uh, offshore wind farms with the greater capacity factors might help. Uh, what else is there? Hydrogen or hydro? Uh, again, my only first thing is that the key part if we ever get some form of an agile tariff is to try and to uh, protect the householders if you are looking at the day ahead market. Uh, but Jamie raised a very good point. Hydrogen is actually noted as one of the key criteria in the Prime Minister's 10-point plan for the, for the Green Revolution. And his aim is to, uh, to put in heating for hydrogen into a town in GB by uh, 2030. Um, hydrogen will be a game changer if that can work in, at a reasonable price. Uh, but I am just want to open that up to, um, I'm looking at Patrick or Barry or Stephen, if you, if you want to have any, or well, Andy, yeah, I'll let Andy through in first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let the speakers in. So, Andy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Robert. I think uh, we have gas power stations anyway, and the most efficient of those are combined cycle gas turbines. And if we increase the overall market for electricity by, for example, doing more uh, heating with even direct electricity, even using more immersions, uh, we can improve the economics of keeping those things going. But also, if you open, if you have new electric heating tariffs, you increase the amount of electricity sold so that you can uh, use those uh, turbines to release essentially three and four times as much wind energy. So you can keep, you can basically keep uh, increasing the amount of wind energy. Uh, you always have to have the minimum amount of turbines for basic electricity demands. Once you've got those, you can uh, generate three, four times as much wind energy. So uh, I think opening the heat market to uh, opening the heat market to electricity is a key uh, is a key move. And, you, and a lot of that is actually just about reallocating costs within tariffs. The tariffs are kind of an artificial construct. Even if the electricity price goes negative, you're still paying something for the electricity, which is kind of a bit of a nonsense. So the tariffs have to be restructured. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Andy. Um, just Patrick, Stephen, Barry, do you want to come on there? Yeah, I, I'll maybe add a little bit there. Um, so Southwest College are, are involved there at the moment. We've just secured an, a new EU project called High Skills, which is all to do with hydrogen skills. So we're going to be developing a curriculum for the hydrogen market in Northern Ireland, um, safety training and all in, integrated into that. Um, the the project um also also with that we're very close to B9 and everything that they're doing at the moment as well. So there is there is stuff to deal with curtailment. I'm I'm not an expert in it. Um and and then another element of it that, that has come across our desk is last week at the UK Passive House Conference, there was a presentation which was very, very interesting as well about how uh, this was of course from the passive house perspective. So I was very interested in it. And they were talking about how, again, it all reverts always back to, you know, having energy efficiency inherent in the first place. And then that reduces, the, they were talking about grey hydrogen and green hydrogen and how the, the supply network based on the gas network will be able to work for that. And again, it was all based on what Robert alluded to there as well, the 2030 framework. Um, so, you know, the future, it, it looks like hydrogen is going to be a big part of the future. 
in in some way, shape, or form. Just before Patrick is on, I just want to make one. To me, the only really hydrogen that's ever going to work is, is green hydrogen. Uh, mm. Anything else is a form of fossil fuel. Um, Patrick, do you have anything to add before we move? Because we've got a couple yeah. more questions coming yeah. up here. From, uh, I just want to go in. So, I think we're we're confusing two questions here. We're asking about um, we're asking about power. Is, is that so? You, I think Jimmy's question is about how do we where does this power come from when we get a, a five day high pressure system and sometime future? There's right, there's a number of ways to deal with that. One is conventional generation, <clears throat> which we still have, we'll still have for some time, interconnection, grid scale storage, and uh, flexible demand. But to go back to the power generation side of it, there's I can see a role for hydrogen in that. Um, Hydrogen is a, is a good form of storage, but it's a very intensive, energy intensive and expensive form of storage. We're kind of confusing it with hydrogen for heat, which I just think will never ever happen because there is, whenever you compare the amount of energy required to heat a home with hydrogen, it's between four and five times the amount of electricity that you would use to run a heat pump. Um, and that then sort of brings the question, well, what? what happens to gas networks. And I, I, I don't see, I, I think what we're doing at the minute by continuing to build gas networks without that question being answered is extremely high risk. And we're in Northern Ireland, we're very different to the rest of the UK. GB has a gas network that's been building since 19, the late 1960s. If it has to be de decommissioned, it has already delivered value, 40 years worth of it. We're building gas networks on the basis that we will be able to, to decarbonize it. And that's very far from clear. The, the, the target is to have one town <coughs> fully powered by hydrogen by 2030. That may or may not happen. In the meantime, heat pumps are business as usual. They're an established, uh, you know, 40% of homes of uh, homes in Sweden are powered by heat pumps. And it's I a, think, I think it's Patrick, a, Jimmy, just to be put on a wee sort of, a wee, a wee qualifier, he's not, he's really talking, he's not talking about negative prices, he's talking about whenever the one basically stops and the whole thing drops off. Uh, so like what you have in February. And again, the only I'd say in that there, like speaking to Sony on a couple of weeks ago, they expect to have gas uh, fired uh, power generation for at least, uh, uh, for the next 20 years. Um, again, if, Jamie, Patrick, do you have anything to sort of add on that there? Really what his question is, what happens whenever we don't have any base load and, and we, we, we don't have any wound? I don't think anybody really has, has, has the answer for, uh, for that right now. I see Jamie coming on there. Jamie, you want to come on there? Yeah, Robert, no more than, uh, by the way, uh, I thought it was a really interesting set of presentations this morning, but no, no more other than to say I wonder if the solution isn't to just festoon the coasts with offshore wind and have actually vastly more than we really need. And indeed, some of that uh, may be uh, unused at times, but that might be just the price we pay. Because if we can get, if we can get so much of it, uh, surely we're oversupplied. So the, assuming that, you know, out at sea, there still would be some, even in the, the almost in the calmest times, there would be, a residual uh, amount of, of power being generated, or indeed hydro or something else. But but I, I was really struck. I mean, I, I don't I don't think it, I asked uh, had it ever happened before that output actually went negative. That the wind that 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 and somebody said, well, what could that possibly mean? They said, well, the the, the, the fact is that the, uh, the the wind farms, I suppose, collectively were sucking in. It was a very small amount of power, but it actually it's. It, the significance of it is that it actually shows how even in this windy climate that we have, where it never seems to be, uh, uh, you never seem to get any uh, any calm weather. In fact, it does occur. And it occurred over a fairly lengthy period. I would think it's maybe three or four days. So there wouldn't be time. Somebody said, well, you could charge up batteries. I said, but yeah, yeah but the, the, the power wasn't there to do that and to supply the electricity needed for the day-to-day -day operations of the economy. So, no, I, I'm sure there are solutions. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting for a minute that, that it necessarily requires gas-fired power stations because you would need carbon uh, capture and storage, and I'm not sure that that has been proved. But we need something. All I'm just saying is we need something we need to think about. It. That's, I don't have any solutions, but I, I'm really interested to hear what people say. 
What Jamie's alluding to is that what Scotland's doing. So Scotland's ambition is to get to 140 percent of renewable demand. I don't know where it's be 2025 or 2030. So they're basically over specking. They're a level of one generation, so they can put it down into the the south of England. And in Ireland at the moment, the aspiration is to put one gig of extra wind onto the system year on year for the next five years. And in context, Northern Ireland uses roughly two gig of wind uh, and its highest level of demand. So, you know, what, what, what could happen in Ireland, because it's an all Ireland energy market, you could have offshore wind in the Atlantic um, and the North Coast and the West Coast. You could have the Celtic Connector, which is coming online in 2026, which means we could overspec our amount of wind whenever we don't need to sell it to Europe, hopefully, and then use it, as Jamie points out, to some of some sort of a banker uh, if you need it at the time, but then how do you store hydrogen, et cetera, has to come in. But that would have put into play, and the ambition, the current ambition of DFA is to go 70% renewables by uh, 2030. Uh, if you wanted to do the, the model, it just says you'd have to have, have, have a lot more ambition. Uh, and again, as people say, Ireland, one to Ireland is what, is what uh, Hydro is to uh, Norway. We have it, so so let's start using it. Um, and that's if anybody's any more points, I just want to go on to uh, the point from Una and just sliding up and down here. Una's point is about FE colleges. Uh, Una, can just let you ask the question because I can't I can't play with chat, speak, and uh, I just don't multitask well. So Una, the, the first no problem. I just was wondering, we're always hearing that the, one of the bottlenecks in this sector is an appropriately trained workforce. And I'm just wondering, you know, is that going to be scaled up quite quickly? You know, is, is there a good geographic spread of FE delivering the type of innovative stuff that I know goes on in, in the Crest and Southwest College? I just wondered if Barry might want to the only thing I could say beforehand is like Southwest are leading, Belfast Met are leading, uh, Circ is leading. But Barry, I'll just let you give the whole official line from the from the FE College. And I suppose it's Stephen on a on an all Ireland basis as well. So, but anyway, go ahead, Barry. No, no problem. Um, as you say, I, I, I do believe that is happening. Um, and more and more, the funding streams which we rely on are, are demanding that we sort of innovate all the time. So it's happening. I, I alluded there to the, the high skills program, uh, and that is EU money, all right. Um, so by cutting our teeth into that through EU projects, what that's doing is allowing us to sort of demonstrate within the department w what we can do and what we can do. And then off that comes the development of curriculum. So all in all, within the FE sector, that is what's happening. Um, across the wider piece in Northern Ireland, um, the different colleges specialise in different areas. Now, our expertise is passive house and it, somewhat the micro-generation renewable energies. And I think we're, we're, we're pushing forward to do a little piece on hydrogen now going forward. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, but the other, the other colleges definitely have their own expertise as well. Um, and then universities, of course, Patrick's here on the call as well. But there's great work going on um, everywhere. Um, it's just maybe that the... the the percolation of all of that down into the curriculum is could probably be quicker. All right, I'd, I'd, st I'd say that. Can I just jump in there? Um, in a, there's a this. I mean, all the talk of technologies is great, and it always gets the sort of the most of the conversation. That, but we go back to the, back to first principles. Energy efficiency is the is it's not the silver bullet, but it's damn close. That's a labour intensive. Uh, industry and money is cheap to borrow and available at the minute and we should be doing that first and foremost and that and training people to do that and getting that uh, we you know our energy efficiency in our houses is, is among the worst in europe um that needs to be addressed before we do anything else and that's something that could happen quite quickly and it's again it's quite a frustrating thing is that we're waiting for an energy strategy we don't need an energy strategy to tell us that we need to improve the efficiency of our housing stock we should be getting on with that um, today yeah, just, okay. just, just to jump Steven, in there yeah. guys as well just sorry about that yeah I, I agree you know with, with the point like we've all these great targets and we're trying to get to 50,000 homes a year but ultimately we, we don't have the workforce currently scaled up to do it and the numbers aren't there to do it 
So I know there's a drive through colleges with NZEB courses and passive house design courses and so on, but it's the guys in the ground that know how to do the proper air tightness measures, the taping and jointing, the, the plumbers who are putting in the, the air source heat pumps and so on, that they know the requirements and how it's commissioned and there's in the independent verification and commissioning. And then in terms of, I suppose, in the South when we're allocating budget, it's, it's so much stop starts. So we've good retrofitters that are skilled but the trick is to keep the funding and the work coming through so they don't move off to new builds and other areas. And so there's a whole myriad of, of, of sections that need to be addressed there to maintain, to train people up and then maintain them in the sector. And, and that's vital if you if get these 50,000 homes a year going forward to 2030. We done a, a, a readiness review with Belfast City Council and, and their uh, uh, PCAN piece. And we basically were asked the three questions. Where is technology now with regard to energy efficiency? And we've seen that as, as basically as the air source of green on the, on the, on the colour coded. And then the question was about upscaling, and we definitely see that as, a, as, a, as an amber. So there's some there, but there's yeah. definitely a lot of work to do. But the key thing for us was funding. So the, the funding was a clear red. There's just not enough funding. And, and in Northern Ireland, our issue is we need a Climate Change Act. We need an energy strategy. We need to see improved building regulations, and for the house edit, we need to see the sustainable business model that the minister alluded to there um, two weeks ago. So we need all them four pieces to fall into shape. Uh, a question here from, from Ryan, and I'll just address you, Patrick, because I know you're looking best with the DFE smart meeting in Northern Ireland. Where 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 are we now? Um, the answer is nowhere. <laughs> no, nowhere. We, 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 I'll we let did. you give the long one to answer. We did have. Um, there was a cost-benefit analysis done in 2010, 2011. At, at the time, we were starting to integrate wind. Um, said, yes, we need them, and we will have 80% rollout by 2020. Obviously, that hasn't happened. Um, we're a long, long way behind where we need to be. Um, typically, when you look at how it's been rolled out the rest of Europe, it takes five years to seven years to actually do. So, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, 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 you know, for the tariffs, like, what we're doing with Roulette Agile or, you know, the likes of Octopus or, or uh, Good Energy, you, you need smart metering. You need to know what was consumed and when. Um, it's, uh, it's something that needs to happen quickly, but it needs to, th that needs to be done in such a way that it doesn't disadvantage anybody. You're going to need to work out who's, it, 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 it needs to be tied to, I think, the way it's actually happening in the South is quite good in that the, the meters were ruled out but were not made live until the tariffs were available for consumers to take advantage of the tariffs. I think, that, I think that's a fairly a fairly good model, but we need to get on with it. Um, so a couple of guys are asking now, they're having to head on here uh, about <coughs> slides. We'll start out the slides in PDF because it's probably an easier way that rather than trying to play with the with with Dropbox, but it'll be coming out from our MR Dev, so if you want anything. <coughs> I'm just looking here. Um, we don't have any more questions, so basically this is last orders. So if you have any more, um, silence is golden. Okay, listen, I want to thank the Hand Heat team. Um, thank in particular Una, Dervla, Amy and Kathleen. They're basically the guys working pretty much full time on this project. Uh, we want to see, a, we're, we're going to have a third webinar session and, and you'll get that out through Eventbrite. But our key uh, moment will be to have the uh, final project conference, which will be held in September, probably virtually, uh, although we will bring the speakers together from across Europe, hopefully it's safe. But the view now about bringing 200 people together and making them drive around and spend carbon, is that a waste of money? Yes, it probably is. Uh, so virtually will, will be our preferred option. Uh, I know that would be MPA's view and thinks, well, who's our funder from Europe? So from the, the handy team uh, and from ourselves, thank you very much. Again, if you have any questions, um, this is all about trying to explain the things. We're, we're, we're very happy to chat to you and hopefully you join us again for our third webinar. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Robert, sorry, if I could just jump in there. Everybody will receive a post-event survey and we would be very grateful if you, if when you get that, you could fill it in and send it back. I don't think it'll take too long, but uh, it'll sort of help us uh, review what we've done and improve what we do the next time. But okay. thank you to all the speakers. It was very, very good. Thank you. Folks, um, if anyone would like a copy of today's uh, um, 
uh, webinar. If you email me at handyheat at nihe.gov.uk, I've put it in the group chat as well, but just in case you've missed it, or if you'd like a copy of the slides or presentations from today's guest speakers, I can certainly get those to you as well. Um, any queries as well, uh, you can get me at that email address as well. I think most of the guys Amy have been looking for this this slide, so you need to probably yep. send that. Yeah, no problem. I can send those out to everybody. Thanks. I'm just going to press the end button now. No Bye. problem. See you guys. Thanks very much.